Hello, and welcome to this second film about the practical aspects of redox chemistry. This one deals with reaction feasibility. So hopefully by the end of this film, you'll be able to use your table of standard reduction potentials to predict whether or not a reaction will happen. That is to say whether it's feasible or not. And once you've decided whether it's feasible, you'll be able to predict any observations that you'll make. If, obviously, if it's not feasible, no reaction will happen and there won't be any observations. Okay. So, bearing in mind that my data sheet is my friend while I'm doing these things, um, we're going to keep this by our side, and we're actually going to look at four different methods for deciding whether a reaction will happen or not. Okay? Um, some of these methods are a bit more powerful because some of them actually allow you to explain whether the reaction will happen. Some of them just give you a simple um, possibility of predicting whether the reaction will happen or not. Okay, so there's four different methods here. I'm going to use each and every one of them for each of the reactions that we're going to look at. And the first one is the reaction between magnesium and nickel nitrate. Now, my first step when I do these sort of things should always be to decide what I've got present to begin with. I've got magnesium atoms, because I've got a strip of magnesium, and I've got nickel ions in my nickel nitrate solution. Okay? Now, a qualitative use of the standard reduction potentials means I look at these and I decide which one's more negative. Well, the magnesium is. Okay? And I should be able to remember from the previous film what that means. That means that this equilibrium lies further to the left than this one does, because magnesium gives up more electrons than nickel, nickel does. Okay? So in other words, this, magne this equilibrium here which isn't shown as an equilibrium on my data sheet, but all these things are equilibria. This equilibrium will tend to move to the left, while this one will tend to move to the right. And yes, that means that magnesium will react with nickel ions, and I'll produce magnesium ions and nickel atoms. Okay? So this rule, or sorry, this method has allowed me not only to predict, but to explain why in terms of equilibrium. Okay? If I was to go for oxidant reductant, Right, I'd be looking at these two things and I'd be deciding, oh, this one's further up to the top left, which is where the strong oxidizing agents are. So nickel ions are a stronger oxidizing agent than magnesium ions. So if nickel ions reacted with magnesium and produced magnesium ions and nickel, these magnesium ions would not be able to take the electrons away from nickel because it's not magnesium ions aren't a strong enough oxidizing agent. Okay, so in other words, nickel would react with magnesium atoms. You could also express this in terms of the reducing agent, right, which says that magnesium is a stronger reducing agent than nickel, so it's more able to give away electrons, it's able to give electrons to something, than nickel is. So magnesium atoms will give their electrons to nickel ions. Nickel atoms will not give their electrons to magnesium ions. Okay? So both those methods so far have explained not a, well, not only predicted whether the reaction will happen, but explained why we think so. Okay, the clockwise rule, which we can use on a waste data sheet because we've got positive numbers at the top and negative numbers at the bottom, says, well, if you're starting with, if you're starting materials, basically, if in turning into the products, if they give you a clockwise loop on your data sheet, that means the reaction is feasible. Okay. Unfortunately, this doesn't explain anything, but once you've decided, oh yes, this reaction would happen, because I've got a clockwise loop going here, then you can just say because nickel ions are a stronger oxidizing agent than magnesium ions, or you could say because magnesium is a stronger reducing agent than nickel. Okay, so the clockwise rule is quite a nice simple way of predicting whether the reaction will happen. It doesn't explain anything. Okay, the last method we're going to look at is to calculate the overall potential here. And the way we do this is we take the standard reduction potential for the reduction process and we subtract from it the standard reduction potential for the oxidation process. Now, what is the reduction process here? Well, if I'm starting with nickel ions, then them gaining electrons is a reduction process. So minus 0.26 is the standard reduction potential of my reduction process. I'm going to subtract from that minus 2.37, okay, and that's going to give me a voltage of 2.11 volts. Now notice this is a positive voltage, 
okay? Which means that the reaction is feasible. If I get a positive voltage by doing this kind of a calculation, that tells me that the reaction is going to be feasible. Because this equilibrium is better at going to the left than this one. Okay? So four different ways of predicting whether this reaction will happen. I'm going to use those methods again in the subsequent reactions, but let's just quickly see what we'd expect to see here. We've got a green solution of nickel ions. The nickel ions are turning into a silvery grey solid, whilst this silvery grey solid is turning into colourless ions. So we ought to expect a silvery grey solid to form on the surface of a silvery grey solid, so you might not expect to see that, but the green solution would gradually fade to colourless. Okay, next one, mixing chlorine water and potassium iodide. A uh, halogen displacement reaction here, the last one was a metal displacement reaction, okay, uh, some people get thrown by the fact that there's water in the description, but any halogen water just means you're dealing with the element itself. And potassium iodide, I've got iodide ions here, and if I was on the waste state sheet, I'd have potassium ions down here. Okay. Now, the chlorine is reacting with one of those two ions. So if I just put the chlorine in green to show that it's going to react with one of the one of the reds. Well, it can't react with this red because that would mean them both gaining electrons or both being reduced. So this one's out of the question. Okay? <clears throat> so, I've ruled out the potassium ions. They're not relevant. Okay? They're going to be a spectator in my equation if I have to write an equation for this. Right? Chlorine, using this first method, has a more positive standard reduction potential than iodine does. So in other words, this equilibrium down the bottom lies further to the left and iodide ions are better at giving up electrons than chloride ions. Okay? So yes, chlorine will react and form chloride ions whilst the iodide ions will form iodine. And it's solid here, but remember it will dissolve in the water. Okay? So what's going on here? Well, chlorine is turning into chloride Iodide is turning into iodine. Why? Well, because this electrode potential is more negative, and so this equilibrium lies further to the left than that one. Oxidant reductant method. Out of my two possible oxidizing agents here, chlorine is the stronger oxidizing agent, so it will oxidize iodide ions. Chloride ions cannot oxidize iodine, so yes, we will form chloride and iodine from chlorine and iodide. Clockwise rule, well, that's the kind of obvious one. Yes, we're getting a clockwise loop if this reaction happens, so it is feasible. And calculating the overall potential, well, that's saying the reduction process, which is 1.36, minus the oxidation, minus 0.54, and that's uh, 0.82 volts. That's a positive number, so yes, this reaction is feasible. And remember, once I've decided that, once I've decided the reaction is feasible, I didn't mention this in the previous reaction, we should know already how to combine these two half equations to get an overall redox equation. Okay? So writing an equation for this, once we've decided on uh, what's gonna, whether it's going to happen or not, is just a matter of combining the half equations. Okay? What are we going to see? Well, a pale green gas is bubbled through this colourless solution, forming this colourless ion, so uh, we're swapping one colourless ion for another one, but the iodine that we form is going to dissolve in water, and we can look that up in our data sheet, that I2AQ is a brown solution, so this colourless solution turns brown as this pale green gas is bubbled through it. Okay, moving on to the next one, I'm trying to speed up a little bit so this film doesn't get too long, placing copper sulphate in an iron bucket, <clears throat> what have we got here to begin with? We've got copper ions and we've got iron metal. This is more negative than this one, therefore this equilibrium moves to the left and this one moves to the right. So yes, copper ions will form copper and iron will turn into iron ions. Okay, oxidant reductant method. Copper ions are a stronger oxidizing agent than iron ions. So copper ions will oxidize iron, or in other words, Iron is a stronger reducing agent than copper, so iron will reduce copper ions. Okay? Clockwise rule, 
we're starting on the left up here and we're starting on the right down there so yes we do get a clockwise loop so the reaction is feasible calculating that we've got the reduction which is 0.34 minus minus 0.45 and that equals uh, 0.79 volts that's a positive number so yes this reaction is feasible what will we see well this blue solution will turn pale green whilst this silvery gray solid dissolves right to form this green solution and we're forming a salmon pink solid on the surface of the iron okay this very very if you ever do this reaction it doesn't look salmon pink it looks kind of brown or sometimes even black but because copper is described as salmon pink on your data sheet you describe it as a salmon pink solid and remember combine the two half equations to get your overall redox equation adding dilute hydrochloric acid to copper turnings what have we got here we've got H plus ions and we've got chloride ions in our dilute hydrochloric acid we're adding them to copper turnings so we've got copper metal Okay, copper metal simply can't react with chloride ions because they both have to lose electrons, so that one's out of the question. We're not comparing the chloride ions here. Hydrogen has a more negative electrode potential than copper. Okay, so this equilibrium lies further to the left, and this one lies further to the right. They're already in those positions, so this reaction is not going to happen. Okay, oxidant reductant. Well, copper ions are a stronger oxidizing agent than hydrogen ions, and hydrogen is a stronger reducing agent than copper. So in other words, hydrogen ions will not be reduced by copper metal, and copper ions, sorry, and you could say that copper metal will not be oxidized by hydrogen ions. Okay, so no, this reaction won't happen. Clockwise rule, well, we're starting with copper, and potentially turning into copper ions and hydrogen ions and potentially turning into hydrogen that's anti-clockwise so it's not going to happen and calculating this well the reduction the reduction would have to be the zero minus the oxidation which would be 0.34 and that's minus 0.34 volts that's a negative number so this reaction isn't feasible uh, observations to be made well the reaction isn't feasible so uh, no visible reaction and a combining well you could combine these two half equations to get an overall redox reaction but it's it doesn't happen so it kind of doesn't make sense to write an equation for that one now then this last one um, it's a little bit tricky um, and actually predicting whether this reaction would happen or not is probably beyond the scope of the waste course but that's not to say this isn't a useful thing to go through and we'll see why in just a moment okay now I'm mixing sodium dichromate so I've got sodium ions and I've got dichromate ions and I'm mixing them with concentrated hydrochloric acid so I've got chloride ions and I've got hydrogen ions okay my dichromate can't react with hydrogen ions because both would have to gain electrons my sodium can't react with hydrogen ions because both would have to gain electrons. So sodium ions aren't involved here, right? And nor are the hydrogen ions. You could say potentially that sodium ions could react with chloride ions, but that's going to give you an anti-clockwise reaction. And it's not going to happen. Uh, hydrogen ions aren't going to react with chloride ions because they're already together so if they were going to react they'd have reacted before you used the acid okay these two do end up reacting even though this cell potential or this redox reduction potential is more negative than that one and even though this equilibrium lies further over to the left than that one does why do they react if this is the case well, explaining this is what you might get asked, okay? So why do these two react when uh, these reduction potentials show that they shouldn't? Well, if we're using concentrated hydrochloric acid, 
then the concentration of chloride ions is much, much higher than one mole per litre. By increasing the concentration of this, we'd expect to push this equilibrium to the left. And we don't have to push it very far to the left to make this electropotential more negative than the other. Okay? So, whilst I would expect that because this is more negative than that one, the reaction wouldn't happen, and because um, dichromate ions are not as good an oxidizing agent as chlorine molecules, and because the clockwise rule isn't obeyed, and because 1.33 minus 1.36 is minus 0.03 volts, wouldn't expect this reaction to happen based on those things. It does happen because we're not under standard conditions. Okay? So if you were asked to explain why this reaction happened in spite of the fact that it doesn't look like it should, the simple answer is we're not under standard conditions because the chloride ions are much more concentrated than one mole per litre. Okay? So hopefully um, you understand a few different ways of predicting whether a reaction will happen or not. There might be one that you prefer to the others, but try and bear in mind that some of them are more powerful in terms of explaining whether a reaction will happen rather than just predicting it. Okay? The clockwise rule is lovely and simple, but it really doesn't explain very much. If I've made any mistakes or if you've got any questions or comments to make, then please feel free to post a comment. It's really helpful for other students. Um, if you'd rather just come and ask a question in person, please feel free to do so, but make sure that you understand what was going on here before you move on.